This is Me, I Am Mental, the podcast. A quick disclaimer. The content you find here is neither intended to be therapy or diagnosis. It is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Me, I Am Mental, the podcast. Um, we are still on set with Dr. Linda Nyamute. If you remember last time we were discussing gender-based violence, um, I think it was an interesting and insightful conversation around GBV. Uh, we agreed that uh, there is need for more awareness raising and building and everybody uh, needs to get a little more engaged so that we uh, at a minimum reduce the trauma associated with GBV and create a healthier society. Uh, today, we would like to focus uh, attention on something a little more, um, shall we say, critical and maybe um, a bit of a tearjerker, really, which is childhood trauma. Now, uh, my understanding of trauma is that it is not usually the thing, the event that you face or something that happens to you. It is how you react to that event. Um, that is uh, my understanding of what trauma is. But, Doctor, if I have missed it by a mile, you can correct me. We are in that space where we can, we will need to learn. Now, childhood trauma is, um, is critical uh, because if a child is traumatized, it means that they're probably facing, um, they're not living within a safe environment. They don't have all the tools they need by themselves to manage their own safety. They rely on others. They probably don't know how to process their trauma, and they are likely to grow up into very damaged adults. Uh, again, I am very roughly paraphrasing. Um, this is a conversation that is, to that extent, very, very critical. So I want to invite um, Dr. Tari to give us uh, some of her own insights around this. Um, just by starting to confirm whether I have uh, captured the essence of trauma like a very educated man or a failed <laughs> <laughs> doctor. Mm, I think the definition of trauma, we need to differentiate trauma the noun and trauma the verb. Uh, trauma the noun is now the more of the event. Okay, trauma is, could be, the way we're talking about violence could be you've been beaten, you've been verbally abused, you've been, uh, children a lot, we have also neglect, childhood neglect, which can be neglect from f basic needs or even emotional neglect. So trauma the noun, and then now trauma the verb is now the experience you have. I feel traumatized, or this is traumatizing. It's hurting you. It's, you know, it's 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 causing some pain of some sort. So there's the noun. The event, the it can be a trauma, a trauma in terms of event. the noun. Yeah. yeah. Um, like a car accident yes. is the event. Yes. Okay, but there are people who get out of the car uh, accident and they're perfectly right. And then there are people who will, for the next three years, be being able to get into a car because they are it, still they, traumatized. they're still traumatized. So that is the the verb. The verb. Uh, for the uninitiated, let me tell you, a noun is okay, we will go there. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and an adverb is the verb that comes before the noun of the verb okay. of the <laughs> yes. no, no, we're not going we to that. Going to go there. Uh -huh. Yes. So you were telling us about trauma. Yes. So in a child. Oh, uh, in children, trauma can be direct and indirect. Uh, 
Um, uh, the effects, I think we'll probably touch that about a bit later. Mm. But when you talk about direct trauma, it's what we know, you know, um, spare the rod and spoil the child, you know. Um, you've beaten this kid to an extent where they are bleeding, they are... You know their back is broken <laughs> to yeah. an extent where you now you now have to to rush to accident and emergency because you've really hurt them or they are going to school with a black eye and no nose on the forehead you know um, so that's the physical trauma the one you know or actually sexual trauma as well um, but then there's also the psychological uh, aspect where uh, a parent can be uttering words that are very hurtful to the child. You find sometimes, um, whether in a, a full um, a, a home with a, both parents or a home that's single parent, you may find sometimes one parent can be, or even both, can be saying things to the child which are quite hurtful to them. Um, you know, just things, you know. Um, so how the how you also talk to, to the child, you know, you're, uh, they have not performed well in school and there's the kind of words that you use uh, towards them. Yes. Then there's also the aspect of neglect. Uh, we've talked about physical neglect where you're not providing food mm -hmm. we've had cases where like whenever there are step parents involved in a in a family they are ne neglecting one child they, they make them do all the house chores they make them they don't give them food their place to sleep is very deplorable uh the the amount of housework they have to do is over the over the roof mm -hmm. then we have the other side where the emotional neglect where the child could be having both parents. They're physically there, mm -hmm. but they're emotionally not present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is still a form of abuse. Okay, because a child still needs love. I mean, we all need love, but a child needs more love <laughs> by far. They need guidance, you know, and what we say with children, uh, part of parenting is a child will not... It will be very difficult for a child to open up to you if they don't feel connected to you. And part of emotional neglect is this loss of that connection. So you'd be expecting this child probably has been beaten in school. They'll not tell you because they don't feel connected to you. They don't feel like you care. They don't feel, they've never felt that. So um, neglect can also be emotional. So who typically is um, the most likely person to cause trauma to a child? Uh, you mean parent or just generally? Generally. The assumption here is that parents, but I, I see that very many people can traumatize a child. Um, I think that will depend from society to society, but I think their fellow children... <laughs> Um, I feel it's the fellow children who will cause more <laughs> trauma to the child. Okay. School, but, bullying, and all that. But um, I'm seeing parents, um, fellow caregivers, teachers, a whole host of people can actually participate in traumatizing a child. True, 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 true. Mm. true. Mm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how does trauma... The event, mm -hmm. the now. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. How does it, in what forms does it create trauma, the verb, in a child? How does it manifest typically? And um, why is it more so with a child than it is with an adult? Why is trauma, why it manifests more so in a child? Yes, because why a child more vulnerable mm -hmm. to certain things than adults? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I feel it's children, one, they don't know, so they look up to you, you see. So if, as a parent, you're the authoritative figure. 
Okay, so this child looks up to you. W- uh, when you shout at them, um, they don't know. I mean, this is what they they already know, but you're the authoritative figure, so they mm. listen. If you shout <laughs> at an adult, like, ah, <laughs> Kwenda, or they shout back, you see? For children, they'll sit there, they'll be stunned, they, they don't know what to do, you know, then they'll be, you know, um... So this is mom, she's shouting, uh, what do I do? I stop and listen, you know, or I cry, or that's all they can do. They can't fight back, basically. One, because you're the authoritative figure. And also the other thing is, especially when it comes from home, this is supposed to be their safe space, okay? So where else would they go? You see, as an adult, you want to shout at me, I've left, I've gone, I've gone home, I've gone, I've gone wherever it is. If I'm going on a holiday, I've gone. So children are trapped. They are trapped, basically. That is, there, there is nowhere they can go. That is all they know. That is the space they know. Yeah. So they're a bit more vulnerable because one, they're helpless. And two, they wouldn't know fast. So some children have just grown up in a violent home where they just shouted out, shouted out, shouted out. To them, that's the normal, you know? So do they know better, you see? So that is the environment they know. That is, that is how they have grown up knowing life, that this is how, this, um, this is how people respond. When, when, when you're angry, you, you shout and you beat each other. And that's what they know. So, yeah, upbringing also matters. It reminds me of this video, I think, that was doing the rounds in, uh, social me- on social media of this, uh, I think she's a house help, and she had this ch- kid was probably like two, could barely speak, and was really smacking the child for not being able to, to I don't know, write or something. Mm. Mm. Uh, I think I saw something you saw like that, that yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I couldn't bring myself to watch to watch that, that, that video. Uh, and then, of course, there are all these incidents of house helps who are left with children. Um, and then, and they, you know, um, they do all manner of crazy things to children. Uh, when, 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 when the parent comes back home, um, the parent is, is unable to understand why a child is, is, is withdrawn or... It's it's very challenging to to get to know if a child is traumatized and and how to fix it. So, how do you? What are the telltale t- signs of trauma in a child? Um, I think um, as a parent, seeing that you've been with this human from day zero of life, you know how they they act. You know how they respond when you call them. You know how they respond when they are upset or when they're disappointed. You know how they naturally are, okay? So whenever you start seeing a change in behavior, they don't necessarily need to be talking, but you can tell this child is not, it's not, they're not excited to see me the way they normally would be excited. They, they, they look very disinterested in things they like. And children, at any given point, they love playing, Unless maybe when they're asleep. <laughs> At any given point, they love their toys, they love playing. You see, this child is no longer interested in playing. There's something wrong there. They, they are withdrawn. There's also something wrong there. They cry continuously. I'm talking for the ones who can't talk. Uh, they cry continuously. Then you can see there's, there's something off there. If they have siblings, you find they isolate themselves from the rest of the siblings. They just want to keep to their corner or keep to their space. You know there's something wrong there. For the older children, um, they can probably tell you. Uh, again, as we said, they need to feel connected for them to be able to tell you anything. So as long as you've created that space, you can talk to them and they can tell you, auntie does this thing or teacher so and so. I remember watching a video where this girl was saying she doesn't want to go to school because... I think it was a teacher Lillian or something. I don't know what teacher Lillian was doing. I don't know, beats them or something because they have peed on themselves or something like The child will tell you, you know, as long as you've created that space where the child feels 
one, I feel safe. This is a person I can trust. They don't lash at me. They don't shout at me. And then when I tell them or, ever, or whenever I have a problem, this adult or authoritative figure sorts it out for me. But whenever a child has needs and you don't sort it out, they cry when they're hungry, you don't bother. Uh, they're in pain, you don't bother. So they grow up knowing that whenever I have a problem, needs are not... this one will never sort out any of my needs. Even when they grow older, you're not someone they'll be going to whenever they have a problem. You probably need to probe and probe and probe. Uh, also for the older children, another thing is you start noticing a dwindling school performance. Um, you may be told things like they sleep in class or uh, they just don't pay attention. They seem zoned out. Uh, you know that, that there's something uh, wrong there. For those who've probably undergone sexual abuse, you you start noticing them having some adult-like behaviors. You know, um, maybe someone passes and they want to... <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just some words, but... Yeah, you start noticing them ha uh, having some inappropriate age... In uh, age inappropriate behaviors, you know, uh, when they draw, that's usually a good way of, of knowing as well, and which which we also use during uh, therapy and also to find out. Just ask them to draw. Uh, sometimes they may not be able to verbalize exactly what has happened to them, but they'll draw for you. They draw for you. This is me here, and this is Auntie beating me. You know, and if you see such, generally, maybe maybe not during that, but maybe that is what they do every day, or maybe that's what they speak about, or they pick their dolls and they beat that doll and they beat it and they beat it, and you see, where well, they're only skizzy and they're beating the doll and they're beating the doll. Where have they learned that behavior? They, it is probably from experience, yeah. So also how they behave with their toys would be one good way of knowing mm -hmm. that, yeah, what what is going on in your child's life. I remember this time I was at, uh, <clears throat> I'd gone to the garage, and as my car was being fixed by someone, uh, by the mechanic, there's a kid who was there, um, a, a, a girl, she's about two years old, uh, very friendly, she comes to me and she tells me, <laughs> Sasa, unataka ni kupikia chakula? Then I say, yes, chakula gani? Then I say, well, we'll take a cup of coffee She says, I think she said something like rice and something else. Mm -hmm. And she's there cooking and just next to me there. And then she comes and serves me. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, for real, these guys mm -hmm. just watch us and do mm -hmm. exactly, you know, so, so in, in a play. Copycat, yes. yes. <laughs> copycat behavior. So you see a child picking the toy, the teddy bear, their favorite teddy bear, and they're spanking it and spanking it and spanking it to the floor. And then you probably you know, be mirroring there's, there's, something. There's, there's in, probably in their something life. they are probably mirroring. So okay. either they are watching it on TV too much, mm -hmm. or they could just be experiencing it uh, themselves. So you find most kids will be nurturing, <laughs> especially the girl children. You find they'll hold their dolls and they'll be like, "Oh, can I feed you?" Because that's what they. That's what happens to them. That's mm -hmm. what the mother does. That's what the nanny does. Can I feed you? I've gone. I've washed you. I've yes. dressed you. And, but the one now is pa pa. How cool it? How cool it? And they are beating the, the 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 doll to, you know, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a problem. There's something wrong. So the other thing is now for the kid whose parents are sort of zoned out, who are neglectful in a way, they mm -hmm. don't, they have no connection with that kid. Um, then it means that they are um, typically the past, the parent who is really engaged is able to monitor and therefore see when there's an issue. For the parent who now is the problem. That kid is in double jeopardy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because the very person who should be looking out and and making sure the kid is all right is the source of the problem. That's true. And I, I assume, therefore, the kid's um, maybe coping mechanism would be what? To repress the emotions, to doubt the... Um, to completely, like, try to to ignore their own feelings or to detach from themselves. How do how does a kid how would a kid cope with a situation like that? How do they manage themselves? Uh, so sometimes they they can withdraw, especially when 
the, no, the research has shown that children who grow up in uh, a family where the mother has depression, uh, and for whatever is reason this research focused on mothers, mm. uh, the children are more likely to have psychological problems, depression included. So you find the child becomes withdrawn. Uh, then you may find some children are quite different. When they enter home, they don't want to talk. They are just isolated. They keep to themselves. They are quite scared. They are... Some end up being even perfectionists because, you know, if I don't do this right, daddy will come and whoop me, you know. Uh, but uh, then you find in school, the teacher will tell you this is the best student, you know. They are just, they're just sweethearts. They're the most obedient, they you know. So it can be, they can either be acting out at home and then good in school or it can be affecting both sides. Um of their lives. So it's interesting how even even being very good in school could be a pointer to could something else. Could be a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Right, they're good in school and then they're bad at home or bad at home or bad in school and then good at home. You, there's definitely something, something off. off. There's mm. definitely, maybe there's some, maybe their teacher is really bad to them in school so they're bad in school and then they're sweethearts at home. There's always something. When, whenever the character is different from one setup to the other, there's usually something that needs to be um, investigated. Yes, yeah, so, so they can be withdrawn, uh, isolated, want to keep to themselves. Some can, as we said, be perfectionists to an extreme. You mm -hmm. know, like it's good to have things in order, but perfectionists to an extreme because they know if I don't do this right, I'll get a whooping. Um, they can also be... Anger outbursts, they can be the bullies that we see. So for them now to cope is, mommy lashes at me, I lash out at the next person. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the bullies, we tend to blame them. Some of them are just also victims of abuse as well. So, yeah. Mm. So what about the long term? Um, so that is like in the short term. As a person is growing, then you see this manifestation of, of the trauma in you know in their lives. But I'm sure there are longer term effects that it, um, maybe into say teenage years, possibly early adulthood, and then now later on, particularly when it comes to their. Their, their relationships with mm. their significant others and future. Would you want to speak a bit to that? Yes, yeah, so uh, you find over the period of time, if they don't, they may develop mental disorders, um, which, I mean, it could be a trigger, um, not necessarily that they will develop, but it could be a trigger for them to develop uh, some mental disorders. Depression, we see it a lot. Um, and self-harming and children who have really mm. yeah, uh, done a lot of self-harming. Um, the other thing is you can find, you see the time around teenagehood, early adulthood, the time of gender identity space. So they're trying to find themselves. In this space they can find, because there's neglect at home, there's all sort of trauma at home they'll end up in the space where they feel loved, okay? And this could be a good space, it could be a bad space. They could find themselves in the wrong circle. People who are thugs, people who do drugs, people uh, who probably take advantage of them, then the next thing they have teen pregnancies, uh, not teen pregnancies and all that. Um, so because they're still trying, they're looking for a space where they can be accepted, a space where they can be loved. Uh, as they grow older, uh, drug and substance use, uh, that is if all this is not addressed, right? Drug and substance use becomes a problem. They can still be bullies, as we talked about. They are just naturally bullies, you know. And then there's this common thing we like seeing as adults. Seta si tulipigwa, tukosawa. You know? No, you're not okay. <laughs> we are not okay. You're not okay. By the time you're justifying that, <laughs> you're yeah, not okay, yeah. you know. And 
even if you are beaten and you, let's say you turned out okay it doesn't mean that now you, whoever you're raising up is not you that is a whole different individual mm-hmm. afresh that is not that is not you that's not a mini you fine they may look like you and all but mm-hmm. it's a whole person with their own uh, <laughs> with their whole own <laughs> personality mm-hmm. you know and just because it worked out for you doesn't mean it will work out for them and that's why you find children within the same environment will always turn out different because they're all different human beings right mm-hmm. so as adults uh, with severe trauma you find also trauma that was not addressed and especially the way we talked about neglect and there's something we call attachment styles when children are small so if they have that attachment style where it was probably non-existent I would uh, just like you cuz that's a very fascinating thing cuz i know <laughs> attachment style people form a healthy attachment during that mm. the, those very early childhood years and they have crazy crazy ramifications in their adult life mm. maybe do you want to just spend a little time just you know expounding <laughs> on that a bit yeah um so for children again as we said uh, the first bonds you make are with your caregiver your guardian your parent whoever it is but your caregiver will be the first bond that you make right so that bond could be a healthy or an unhealthy bond a healthy bond is as we said you cry they bring you they breastfeed you so mm-hmm. let's say it's a mother mm-hmm. you cry she picks you she breastfeeds you you're soothed you had a need it was met. you reached out it was met you are satisfied you're contented you know then also when you don't have needs they reach out to the bonding where the mother or the father or siblings play with the child so secure attachment you know um whenever they fall down they get hurt and someone is like okay where you hurt okay you'll get better don't worry blah 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 and it's fine then now we have the over the overs on this side and then the overs on that side Mm-hmm. the one the over who will not respond child is crying and like oh my god not again and they'll be left to cry for like another 20 minutes or so what a lelie kidogo before you meet the needs right mm-hmm. so this child grows up knowing my needs are not so important or they're about so the attachment style becomes a bit more of a reactive or disinhibited reactive being those who cause tantrums and now whenever their needs are not met they cause tantrums they are you know they flip tables blah 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 then we have the one who's disinhibited who will be a bit more whatever detached mm. basically mm. yeah whatever mm. then on the other side now so we talked about secure then we have the other one who's overly protected you know small thing haha <laughs> So, you know, helicopter uh, parenting. You know, you yeah. like literally yes. here, and yes. that is equally as bad as the other one. Okay. Yeah, because smothering. Yes, especially in adult life, because uh, these are people who grow up with this sort of entitlement of things have to go my way, things have to be my way or the highway. instant gratification I, i i did this and i want results now you know give me this now i mean that's how they have grown up uh, knowing i i want yogurt i'm getting yogurt now there's no time for waiting there's no yeah so uh, you can see how and then this other group will be they don't want help from anyone no one helps me anyway let me figure out life by myself So you can see how this can be a challenge especially when it comes to forming relationships. This one would be whatever yeah. I want, I want it no, now. Yes. You yes. know, and they things have to be yes, things have to be my end, you know, with intimate relationships selfishness can never be uh a part of the recipe otherwise it's done. Mm-hmm. Then on this other hand, the one who doesn't even want to probably open they are they are detached they are detached from you so they are they are here but they are not they're not present they're not they're not intimate they, it's hard for them to form intimate bonds because do they how will they trust you they don't trust people because there's no one to trust or whoever they trusted ended up 
not fulfilling their needs or never meeting their needs. So they've never known what it feels like to trust. So attachment styles, yes, they do impact a lot in the adult life. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that that's that that is um, it's probably really fundamental for any parent or for any person in that, particularly those very early years, yes. to understand how critical their behavior is. Because we assume that you know, there are a lot of things you can do to a child at that time because they, they're, they're not talking or mm, what, mm. which has no real impact. But apparently that's not the case. That's I think case. it has lifelong uh, like, you consequences. Know, consequences if you... And then I think a very critical period aside that childhood is this time preteen to teen years. Yes. That's another very critical point. Because again, as we said, there's a lot of identity... Uh, and role, role identity sort of crisis for some. So there's this confusion that point. They need guidance, okay? So if you're overly here, you're my handbag. Where yeah. I go, you go. You don't give them the space to, to be independent, to, you know, make mistakes and come back home. And not that I'm saying that they go, but... They can explore. They can explore knowing that they have a they have safety. They yes. can they can go out there even yes. if they make a mistake. They yes. can always have a place to retreat yes. to yes. and yes. get soothed yes. and yes. that sort of thing. Yes. They have a base camp. Yes, not soothed, but they can have a place to come back. I have made a they, mistake. Mm-hmm. I may not be soothed. Okay, there may be repercussions to it, but there's a place they can come back. You 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 pointed out not soothed. Yeah, uh, not necessarily soothed. The soothing is is it is soothing like the equivalent of handbag? It, <laughs> it would would it have that maybe that same effect? Because it will feel like I've made a mistake. They go home, we downplay that mistake, and it's okay. It's okay. Uh, you did what? Oh, okay. You 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 beat people over there outside, and then oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe yeah. they had a problem. You don't know. People nowadays fight. No, it should be, okay, fine. Depending on what situation it is, you can come back home. There may be repercussions. There may be a punishment to do. But there's always home. But this is home. But there's always home. Yes, yes, yes. We got you. You're ours. We will beat you. But you're ours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nice. that creates a safe space for them to be able to, you know, so you want them to explore, not overly explore as well now where you're neglecting them. You go figure out life for yourself because that is also, there are parents who are, you find there are people who they have nice homes, parent is there, mom is there, dad is there, they go to work come back later in the evening. School fees is always paid. There's no day you'll ever be sent home from school. TV you want to watch, it's there. You have even your own TV in your bedroom if you want. But the emotional aspect for the parent and the guidance, this person goes out there to the world. Everything has always been served to them on the platter, you know. Um, They go, Dad, I need... um, Let's say an iPad tomorrow. Oh, okay. And you see a lot of parents who work a lot do feel like, so, okay, no, let me retake that statement. There are parents who feel like just providing, have paid your fees. What do you need? A computer? What you got? You need what? A phone? Okay, have it. That's not. And a lot of have children it. will tell you that's not. That's not enough. Have so they'd rather even not of... have that, but have you present. Are some parents um, sort of doing that to substitute uh, for time? For time, for that, time not there. being available, mm-hmm. and it happens a lot. I've met a lot and handled a lot of teenagers who have been in those cases, and there was one even I felt uh, it was so overwhelming because the father was so upset and it's like I've done everything for this girl, you know, and the girl just says, "I don't need all these things." All I wanted is for him to be present. I need someone. The mom had passed on, yeah? So I need someone to talk to. There are things that she gets, not bull, not overtly bullied, bullied past in school, but you know, like teenagers, how they can be what you mm-hmm. from time to time. She needs some guidance, you know, on how do I 
maneuver through some life things. But I felt like I've paid you fees. Anything you need, you have it. There is monthly upkeep, you have it. What more do you want from me? I'm like, so, none of this matters. So that's how we grew up. We grew up with... Uh, and that's why I say bit. we're not okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we grew up being told generally that um, once your parents, especially your dad, when they provided materially for you, and, and you have to acknowledge that many of them sacrificed quite a bit just mm-hmm. to be able to provide. So I think they saw that sacrifice, and when they presented that, they assumed that you had everything. If you were asking for more than that, then they would interpret it as you being a brat. Mm-hmm. So um, and and so what you did is, for the most part, you stifled quite a bit of this this other things that were, you know, uh, sort of begging for attention in you. And over time, you normalize it, and maybe you also become this maybe cold, aloof. And why I say we're not okay, look at, I know there's no research to back my findings, but just look at generally when people grow older, who do they take care of more? The mothers or the fathers? The mothers. Exactly. Because the fathers, you sort of, I don't know what happens. I see it's because fathers. mothers were emotionally present. You provided for me fine, but we never formed a bond. With you? You're right. That makes perfect sense. We I never think, formed yeah. a bond with you. So now we've grown. Okay, fine. I'll take care of you. You need to go to the hospital. Okay. We'll take care of you to the hospital. We'll pay your bills. Become so very now, obligatory, very yes. mechanical. The very, same way. It was yeah, mechanical, but it's yeah, now mechanical nah. here as well. Yeah. Your mom is sick. Everyone travels from Nairobi and goes to Shags. We have to see mom. Dad is sick. Okay, Ebu, Changeni Pesa. You need to take that to hospital, okay? I'm a Peleko hospital, yes, okay. Then from time to time, and the lady, and in the lady. Do they push further? Do they go that step further? Why is Mother's Day more celebrated? Why is than Father's Day? I just think women make a lot more noise than me. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go. So. Women also celebrate themselves on Father's Day. <laughs> <I know. laughs> I don't want to cause <laughs> us to overrun that, but but yes, I I think I think that um, I also just generally would say um, um, it's not we, mechanical. I've given you, I've given you, I've given you. It's fine, and, and you'll pass it on to your child because yes. at some point, it, like in my case, um, I don't even think my dad was doing that deliberately, but he wanted to for us to be toughened up. Okay. Uh, I think in the process, there are like 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 acres and acres of our 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 inner territory which are are fallow. You never mm-hmm. cultivated them. Mm-hmm. You just mm-hmm. so you just did the mechanical stuff. Then you become this adult dude, and you you have children, and you you also would probably just be able to to give from what you understand, and so you repeat the same mm-hmm. and. But again, as I said, it didn't turn out okay because what happens? We when when dad needs help. Uh, okay, okay. How much does he need? Okay, and it becomes so, very. It's so that's not that's what's going to happen to me, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew <Not> my words. <laughs> so, but yes, yes, so we need to form bonds. Because if there exists no bond, there's no way you expect now when you're older in your... And you know, um, once people get... Your circles become smaller. When people are older, like you're now in your 80s and stuff, most of your friends... No offense, but most of your friends passed on. Your group of circle is smaller and smaller. And you've retired home back to the rural village. It's... A very small group that you have, probably just your family, right? And there was no emotional bond. They're fine. There'll ne- maybe never be a day where you sleep hungry because they'll be sending money. But that's just about it. And again, I think what we said, emotional <laughs> connections, human being, emotional, we are social beings. 
That's fascinating. That's really, really fascinating. So um, I'm hoping um, that when we have... I think that the trick perhaps is to acknowledge if, for instance, you're, you're, you're ill-equipped in some ways, then you want to be the one to, to break the cycle. Yes. Which means you probably need to do so much more, even in your adulthood, to try and cultivate ways of being that create the possibility of having that emotional relationship with your children and having them look at you as an all-rounded person, not as a checkbook. <laughs> or, yeah, or, ATM. Or, or ATM, <laughs> or, you know, yeah. And for yeah, a lot of yeah. children, dad is ATM. Dad is ATM. And there are some where mom is ATM. And there are families where mom and dad are both atm you go atm number one after that one gives you you go to the other atm number two none of them needs to know that this one gave you money and you play games because mm -hmm. when within the family we don't talk we don't connect so i go here dad i need money <laughs> mom i need money <laughs> So going back to childhood trauma, and this is so if you were to say raise a child at a bare minimum, what are some of the things you have to f try and put in place as a parent? Mm. In this case, you're a parent. Some of the things you really have to struggle to, to put in place to ensure that our kids' needs are may not be perfect, mm. but I generally met. Mm. And even if you're, you know, you, you always have a way of bringing things back to, to a place where this kid is likely to, to make it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the mm. other, maybe at some point as part of this conversation on, on childhood trauma, is what is the effect of um, technology? And this, by this I mean the information we are consuming, mass mm. media, social media, what is the effect that that has? Does it have a traumatizing effect on children and how do we also manage that? But firstly, the question around mm. the, the basic setup. I think uh, there's no life manual to parenting. There's no manual to life. There's no things. People just do what best works. However, uh, as we said, a bond, the bond, the first, a child, the first bond that they make will sort of influence every other bond they make, all right? So uh, providing that secure bond for them, not being overly... Kibeti. Kibeti, not being overly in their space, giving them room to explore, but also protecting that space of how much they can explore, but also giving them the space to know they can always come back. After exploring, it's like children in the park. Okay, you've taken them to play. They know this is the only place. They can only play here. Okay, but they can play everywhere around here. And then when they are tired or they want to know, they come back to you, right? It's the same concept. Give them space. They knew. Uh, they also know they can always come back. So the bond, bonds, bonds, bonds cannot be, have to be well put in place. The other thing is discipline. Uh, I, I like that statement for spare the road and spoil the child. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, because comes the question, where do you draw the line, right, between discipline and abuse? Mm -hmm. um, so you want to discipline your child, but you don't want it to be abuse at the end of the day. Um, the question on whether caning should be done or not, uh, it's not a topic I'll go into. However, however you're disciplining your child, should be to the extent that it does not cause trauma to them. And trauma, I don't mean physical trauma per se, but also psychological trauma. Because mm -hmm. there's how we discipline children and it's so traumatizing that fine, they may not repeat that mistake again, but you've also interfered with their self-confidence, their self-esteem. You've made them feel like now there's nothing else they can do and they withdraw from exploring at Absolutely, all. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, or you go and discipline this child and now now they want to do exactly that so that now 
yeah tuone when you chop it tuone you see so it has the discipline of whatever you do has to be uh different children you'll find even within the same home different children will respond differently to different disciplinary measures so it's also important to understand your child the ch- children who probably taking away a gadget or uh, a play toy or whatever that will that's enough that's enough there are children who sit on the corner especially the ones who love talking and socializing <laughs> You doing that for 10 minutes that's just like oh my god when does this, this is, end you yes. know like this is just, oh my god oh my god you've not traumatized them per se uh but you know because you've taken out what they like doing and it's always important before disciplining the child to explain why oh, what is it that you did i i i broke i jumped on the chair and you said i don't jump on chairs okay What did we say about jumping on chairs? It is bad blah 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 blah. Did we warn you? Yes. So what and sometimes it's best it helps when they they are also involved in the punishment. So what did what how do I punish you? Or what do we what did we say we'll do punishment or what how do I punish you basically? And they'll tell you uh take this 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 so they are also involved in their punishment mm. and they also feel response that they now know why am i being punished i'm being punished for one two three and um uh next time i should not do it so sometimes negative punishment which is that uh could be better than positive punishment which is the literal caning and stuff however it's good to understand your child uh, different children different needs so discipline has to also be there they need to know these are the rules of this house this is what we accept this we do not accept at all and once they know that it's much easier to know mm-hmm. i did this they'll come home mm-hmm. and sometimes they even report themselves i did da, 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 da. okay and then they'll tell you I've gone to my corner. <laughs> you know because they already know. Yes, yes. This was said, yes. this is illegal so, and I've already I'm already ready for my cause and effect and sort of they yes. they begin to understand how life works. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. You do something, you go, yes, then this is. Uh but it's also important not to be too strict because there after you get very you know individuals who are yes. very perfection mm. oriented to an extent where even a small blunder is they It, overreact mm. when they're adults you know sometimes you also give children room to make mistakes uh some not all mistakes should be punished of course now you way basically but bonds and discipline uh very important so you need to know where do you balance love in discipline okay okay social i mean technology and and its contribution in childhood trauma mm-hmm. in this day and age there's so much out there matters uh, internet there was a time there was this internet craze about I think there's one for I don't know what, what was it called blue whale or something I can't quite remember but or was it this thing where you would play and then there would be some instructions that yes. could, that given lead to suicide yes. or something yes. self harm yeah. and, mm, and suicide and things like that. Mm. so uh we're in an age where you need to be probably not control but you need to be aware of what your children are consuming on the internet. Uh a lot of internet platforms have given up YouTube for example has given you the space for child parental something Control. like you can yeah you can put uh such that they only watch things which are within their age. Sorry um then I think their platforms their platforms which you should just not allow your children to be on until maybe they're much older um things where they get i mean 
at the end of the day, what 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 are they benefiting from being on that platform? TikTok, let's say, Instagram, let's say, uh, an eleven year old, ten year old on on TikTok. I see some of them doing very weird videos. I'm like, you're just a child. You're supposed to be playing with mud <laughs> and eating grass. You know, like chabama <laughs> chababa. That's what no. we were doing at your age. Yes, you know, now I know the game. Ricky Joe and what not. What's, that's what you're supposed to be doing at this age. You go mm. play jump rope, kati, and all that. What are you doing on TikTok? Mm. You know, um, and they make videos. They get bullied. Oh, your nose is so flat. You know, and you're wondering why. So um, even as we give children phones and gadgets, uh, probably you need to time how much time they spend on that. And you need to be aware. They need to tell you. Or you need to be aware of what platforms are they going to. Um, YouTube has a way of storing history. So you can just allow them to, and then you look at what it is they're looking at. You can have a family account, and that is what is in the is in the gadget such that even if you're not present, you're still able to see what is being viewed mm-hmm. uh, without them necessarily knowing that you're viewing so that they also don't feel like you're spying on them too much. Um, that would be a good way of... You need to know what they're consuming and there are some where you just need to completely not... I feel like for 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, when do they need to be on platforms where do I where, where, but now there's even infants on Facebook <laughs> with their own pages but uh, why would a 12 year old need a Facebook page hmm. because that, that exposure to a whole world of um, if they are probably their own age mates like you say they might be bullied but they are also creeps out there yes and yes. and also there's some content which um, I suppose that's why TV in terms of ratings yes is also critical because um, I remember there was a time I watched this. Uh, I didn't. I, I happened to just log uh, go, go onto my phone. I went onto WhatsApp and then there was this video. And when I clicked on it, I just saw a video of a girl being murdered. It was very. It was very very visceral because mm. it was right there, mm. and I think it took me about three or four days to just get over that mm. that 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 image, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 even up to now, I think whenever I think about it, it's very very. And so I can imagine your child opening that, stumbling onto that, and what. At, and, and and what it would do to them. I think that's that's incredible trauma, isn't it? I think it? there was a time also on Facebook, I don't know what was going on, or maybe it was just my group of friends, but I'm sure this went on for a while. So sometime last year, if I'm not wrong, mm-hmm. there was a weird, I don't know if it was a virus or something, but, and I don't know why people were clicking on it. <laughs> Yeah. But it's like you have been tagged with you and 99 others. And anytime you'd see you've been tagged with you and 99 others, you know, it's those, uh, there were pornographic videos. Mm. I assume because of the title. Me, mm. I never clicked on any one of them because mm. I was like, hey, and then it starts showing up on all my platforms. <laughs> you know. So whenever you'd see you've yes. been tagged with you and 99 others, you just, oh my God. Uh, and it yeah. was, it went on for like a whole month. And I'm like, why do people keep clicking on this uh, sites? But mm. I, I wouldn't know whether there was actually any visual or can, what kind of content was there, but mm. I'm assuming from the captions that were there, if your teenager son has been tagged with those 99, 99 others, others, what, what, what happens? When they get to stumble upon, mm. you, you see, they get exposed to information before you have the chance to actually talk to them about maybe sex education and things like that. So uh, you need to know, I feel like some platforms are just out mm-hmm. until a certain age. Mm-hmm. What is the importance of them being? I think that is the first question you need to ask. What is the import? What value does it add you being on this platform? What value does it add you having a phone? What value do you need it? As in, Rather than everyone has it, everyone is doing it, you need to teach your child also peer pressure, not to conform to it. And the minute you conform to peer pressure, you teach them that they also need to go with the flow. And you're teaching them that moving with peer pressure mm. is okay. So that is 
and that, that is, is what also. they'll be doing. Mm-hmm. So and so has bought bought a phone, the latest phone. That is what they want to do because that is what you've taught them. When everyone is in my classes on Twitter. I have to be on Twitter. That is exactly what you've taught them. You see, and then they get there, and it's problems. Mm. So also things like Instagram. Instagram has a lot of flashy photos. You see, so I enter Instagram. We're in class with. Um, I use Mary Jane. This one is called Mary Jane out there. They probably hate me now. <laughs> I use that example all the time. But yeah, let's say we're in class with Mary Jane. Mary Jane keeps flaunting how their family has gone to Maldives for the for the for the mm. Easter. And then it's August holidays. They have gone to wherever they have gone to. You know. Um, and then you start you start having these things for mom. Why aren't we? You know, and so they start having this comparison, and you know, start, sometimes they start feeling inadequate. At the end of the day, um, some of these things can just be avoided. Um, I think before you expose them to that, you need to have them learn fundamentals yes. in yes. life. Mm-hmm. It's okay not to have things when you want them, it's okay. Uh, sometimes you'll have more things than others because sometimes some children also feel guilty uh, when some yeah, when they have and others don't. Mm. Yeah, and some feel bad when everyone else has and they don't and they start feeling, you know, inadequate. Mm. Mm. So also teaching them all these fundamentals, you know. There are people who will be much richer than us and that's okay. There are people who will be poorer than us and that's okay. And that's how life is, you know. Uh, you teach them all. Sometimes these people are putting out a fake lifestyle, so that they know. Mm. So that by the time they are when they getting to out it, there, yes. they already have their fundament. They have their basics such that anything can come. I can decide what to do with it, but I already have the know how of either how to deal with it or about this information. If it's sex education, they already know. You've already taught them so, such that by the time they're being teenagers, their hormones are starting to, mm. you know, starting mm. to want to explore. Or they open Facebook and there's someone who's, you know, um, really on their case, maybe much older, who knows, I can take advantage of. They already know. Mm. Mom said this, dad said this. This is wrong, da 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 And whenever they're faced with a situation out there, they can come and tell you, you told me, when someone says this, I should say this. But then, I found someone who said this. What do I do? You know, mm-hmm. but because you've already set that base for them to know this is right, this is wrong. Ideally, I mean, we said there's no manual, but there are those. So it's a more sustainable to... way of a, because you cannot anticipate every situation yes um, you can't control you what can't they're control exposed what they're to. being exposed yes. to so the thing is how to they navigate that space yes. is is, yes. is what's and then that 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 um, uh, sort of um, hotline like they can always get back you back uh, to, to you in case yes. of an emergency yes to, to 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 clarify a few things yes 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 it's always very important Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, I wanted to flip this question uh, from the child and look at an adult who suffered childhood trauma mm-hmm. and is unaware that they are acting out mm-hmm. the, the trauma mm-hmm. of childhood. And how do they, what would you advise a person who, to do when, or I suppose, because... For, for the most part, many of us carry bits of trauma mm, with us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I suppose childhood trauma, especially when it's sig- severe, can be very um, impairing in future mm-hmm, life. Mm-hmm. Suppose you, you get to that point where you recognize that whatever is happening to you could be as a result of your childhood. How do you manage? What, what would you advise this person to do? Um, so there's a few who would actually recognize that it's what happened to me, especially when there were significant traumas, things to do with maybe sexual abuse, rape. Those ones usually know, you know, it's because of what happened to me. Maybe that's why I'm having difficulty. Um, 
with attachments, trusting people because of that. Then there are those the ones you said, small, small, and maybe not very obvious sort of trauma. Many times those ones will not present directly. You know, it will be something else. And then now when you sit in uh, during the interview, you know, uh, consultation rather, maybe they come in with the depression. They feel like there's nothing fulfilling in life anymore. They feel like they're just low for whatever reason. Or they have difficulty with relationships and they don't know why, mm. you know. Or they have difficulty letting go of people whenever there's a breakup. They don't know why, you know. So now they may not be able to know that it's these childhood traumas that cause. And it happens a lot. We get patients who come in for whatever other reason and then things come, there was this things that happened when you were younger and then they were unresolved and now this is not where we are at, okay? So sometimes sitting in and looking at some of the behaviors that we have, uh, some people are able to do it by themselves. A lot of people need some professional guidance to it. Yeah. Okay. But as we said, broken children become broken adults. And, uh, of course, now broken adults will now end up raising broken children. Children, the cycle continues. And the cycle continues. So what sort, sort of help should should one seek? Um, I think... Bearing in mind as well that especially professional help for many of us is not um, available. Just your numbers as, as professionals in the mental health space is very low. Secondly, mm -hmm. the, the cost is sometimes prohibitive. Um, so um, if, if somebody was to try and seek some intervention um, within those constraints, what? So, <laughs> yes, our numbers are not that, but it depends on what numbers. If you're looking for a psychologist, I think those ones are quite, uh, quite many. We're just not aware. Okay. But they are there. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, numbers of psychiatrists are also increasing, so very mm. soon we'll stop that narrative. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had Dr. Chitai say the same thing. Uh, yeah. it's, it's very exciting. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So very soon we'll stop that narrative. Mm. Um, however, there are helplines which are there for people to, which some are free, uh, Red Cross. There's uh, Samaritan, there's some national hotlines for different things, like the one we gave for GBV, this one we gave for, uh, for child abuse, I think it's 1196. For GBV, as we said, is 1195. Red Cross should be 1199. Uh, you can just call in and just talk to someone if you feel like you want to talk to someone. Um, it would be difficult to give a one one shoe fits all mm. sort of approach mm. to people because again as i said different people react differently so sometimes you can give an approach and then it ends up worsening <laughs> the situation for someone else and works perfectly for someone else so seeking professional advice especially when you're not sure of what to do mm. and sometimes part of what we call introspection and self-awareness is to Talk to people and just ask them what they think about you and just get their perspective. If you talk to fa family member number one, family member number two, friend number one, friend number two, and they seem to say the same things about you, what don't you like about me? What do you think are my weaknesses? Or what can I improve? Then you seem to have the same kind of um, pattern or same kind of behaviors across the board. Mm -hmm. Then you need to look into that. A lot of us don't want that part of being told you're bad in this area. We want to be good and perfect because we are good and perfect, you know. But actually when you sit with people who know you better, they can tell you there's this thing that you do which is not nice. Then now, maybe you can look at those behaviors. Do they have any background towards uh, your childhood or your growing up, your upbringing and then now you're able now to Look, did I have any trauma? What was it? Again, as I said, sometimes it's usually a bit difficult to do it by yourself. But for those who can, 
Yeah, yeah. So the best approach would probably be if you can access professional yes. Uh, yes. Uh, help. Because you see, the problem mm. with childhood trauma into adulthood, it becomes complex. It's, it's now very become complex, complex, isn't it? Sometimes yes. you can't tell that some behaviors have yes. been attributed to this mm. because over time, your brain, your character has changed mm. to accommodate that, you know, and sometimes in negative ways. So you may not... It's probably Even. camouflaged to something else. <laughs> yeah, someone has to be the one to actually be able Point to... Point it out and yes, break it down for you. I, 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 I know of a word. I'm very proud to know this word. <laughs> Preverbal. <laughs> <laughs> So mm-hmm. Some of the stuff is pre yeah. So yeah. you, you, and then apparently some parts of your brain, some of the stuff occurs before certain parts of your brain are developed. Finished developing. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. So it becomes very complex. And your personality has also not finished developing when you're mm-hmm. still in your late teen years and whatnot. So you finish growing up and your body grows up with those traumas. So it also, it's like, a broken bone, yes. right? You break a bone, it's never repaired. The rest of it will continue growing, but it will grow with that deformity mm-hmm. and it will find its way of mm. continuing to grow. If this is never repaired, it will either stunt or something, but your body will just find a just, way of, just, of, of yes. dealing with it. Mm. Yeah, which is the same thing. So sometimes you may not be able to tell that this actually behavior is stemming from my childhood. Sometimes you may, but... Yeah, a lot of times the complex, it becomes more complex as you grow um, older. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, I think we have covered quite a bit around childhood trauma. Um, from where I see it, it still seems to me as if, if we are able to raise children the way they should be raised, then potentially we would eliminate quite a chunk of uh, the mental health issues we are facing. The most people would grow up uh, healthy mentally, mm. Mm. feeling loved and accepted and able and resilient and able to do life, face life's challenges. I think a large part of um, of what we are doing is uh, we are probably don't even know how much damage we are doing when we raise children. Uh, the way we do, mm, uh, the or the way we are raised, okay. yeah, and we turned out okay. So, um, especially for those who don't have children, for parents who have children who then are aware that there is potential that the children went through trauma, what would you advise them to do? Again, seek. For parents who are aware their children went through trauma? Yes. Like maybe I raised my children. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at some point I recognize that, whoops. Maybe. I mean, it's never too late. So you can, at that point, maybe try to do a few things yourself. But it might also be beneficial to s- seek help for the children. Uh, or that that's where the problem comes. You're not seeking help for the children. Seeking help for all of you. The minute you detach yourself from that story, that's because you're still that guy. (laughs) You're still detaching yourself. You're like, you guys have problems. Go deal. You also have a problem because you are probably, maybe unknowingly, the perpetrator of that violence. So you also need to be part of the solution. So So you don't. So the family then needs to. Yes. But sometimes, sometimes, or anyway, depending on how bad it is, sometimes all it needs is just to have family meetings, sit down and just talk. I mean, uh, sometimes maybe you don't need to start it directly like, yes, I know you guys are traumatized, you know, but uh, sometimes you can just start with simple chats. How are you doing? How often do we sit down as a family and just, how are you doing? What problems are you going through? Everyone is nowadays too busy for everyone. Everyone is on, I need to, to catch up with my Facebook friends. Don't catch up with the people that actually matter. How's your day? How is, what challenges have you been going through? You know, it starts there, you know, and that's how bonds are created, okay. you know. So sometimes maybe it doesn't need to start at, at therapy. You start at home. Then once you identify that, you know, um, there's this 
obstacle that we've got into or that these challenges that we've seen as a family and we probably don't know how to go about it and then now you can be able to seek uh, help and say okay. yeah, 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 yeah that's that's a very good good um, mm -hmm. answer to you all parents because uh, you can see the rest this slide somewhere um, that's why right now you see parents coming out <laughs> like I saw the other day seeing their children don't come back home they don't send money they don't and their children are doing well off here in the city why they probably never had no born you just fled yeah there's probably no born there's yeah. no reason for me to you know a child who grows up in a family love and there's a bond they'll always want to know how you're doing that is what relationships are you know it's I'll be concerned. How, how are you faring on? Even if I'm not here with you, even if I'm in States or, or I'm in New Zealand, I still call back home. How is my mother? How is my father? How, how are the people I, how are they doing? You know, but I could be here. I, you, you are just here in Kikuyu. You'll never see me three, four years. You don't hear from me whether I died. You don't know, you know. Why? Because you didn't create that one. So it, once... It's never too late. Sometimes maybe a bit difficult to try and initiate a bond. Uh, a lot of times parents, it's really difficult for them to acknowledge that, you know, I caused trauma to this person. It's difficult for them to apologize. And sometimes probably that's all a child needs for you to just say, I know I did you wrong and I'm sorry. I have a story there. So there's this guy uh, that when we were speaking, he was about 50 years of age. And this gentleman had was on extremely bad terms with their dad. Kisa Namana, when they were growing up, the dad, uh, at a very early age, the dad, for some reason, uh, um, sort of exiled him to go and live with the grand grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, he never had the... And the dad was very neglectful. Then at some point, the dad abandoned their family and I think went to another country, married a woman there, got a family, raised some children, abandoned that family again, mm -hmm. went to Mombasa, married another woman, at some point abandoned that family again and then now ended up in Shags. And so, and when he was in Shags, obviously now he's an elderly man, frail, uh, vulnerable, in the usual way, maybe needing a lot of assistance. Um, this, he, was, he wasn't, he was poor, but this guy was very, very hostile towards him. And they were not on talking terms. And he was literally making a point of making the dad feel the you know, the, 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 the grudge anger, or the yeah. anger and everything. But at the same time, it was, it was cutting him up quite a bit. So every time he would talk, you would see a man who is torn. He is torn by his own anger. He, he feels like he shouldn't be treating the dad that way, but on the other hand, he feels perfectly justified. And then uh, at some point we told him, okay, uh, so you, we need, you need to sort of maybe just try and find a resolution to this. And because you're an adult now um, and you're not necessarily as vulnerable as you are when you're a child, you can also initiate the conversation mm -hmm. and see. Maybe it will go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think he took a chance. And on one of those occasions, he, he did, I think, break the ice with the dad. And what he thought would be something like, hey, dad, how are you? And the dad just latched onto that opportunity. And the dad just broke down and told him, guy, I am so, so sorry mm -hmm. for what I put you guys through. I, I know everything I have put you guys through. I really regret all of it. I... I have always, always been hoping you would just give me that opportunity for me to apologize and tell you how terribly wrong I was. And the guy was stunned. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he was stunned because that apology just, it didn't take everything away, but yeah. it did set 
like the tone for you know the possibility for reconciliation and it's strange how as children we always love our parents regardless and i think they also love us and 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 so even at, at that very advanced age i think they still were able to begin a journey that would probably lead to a place that um uh even if uh they were to eventually you know the dad was to depart or something mm. there would be a sense of peace and mm. something mm. worthwhile so yeah i Do agree you think the the problem is a lot of us no one usually wants to be the bigger person yeah everyone wants the parent wants to be me apologize to a child yes you know and the child is like me there's no way they're the ones who hurt me yeah why would i be the one to start that conversation you yeah. know so uh i think sometimes just allowing yourself to be the bigger person which mm. sometimes so, so may it has feel its like risks you're, you're demeaning yourself yes. but you're actually being the bigger person in that in that space and sometimes even i mean as you said a lot of our parents brought us the way they were brought up sometimes they don't even know the, yeah it wasn't they were not deliberate yeah they're, they're not, not deli- then they did you. what they know best mm-hmm. they are probably not even aware of what the damage yes. you know? yeah yeah here i see everywhere nowadays they say uh, toxic parents toxic families toxic what we can always try and start somewhere Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, I mean, family is family is still the fundamental, yeah. Social unit. That's that gives you, for the most part, that that's what gives you the shelter and the sort of sanctuary you need to be you. Yeah. Uh, the launching pad, <laughs> so to speak. And I think also for your own peace, because mm-hmm. you see, as an adult, just carrying these grudges and carrying these grudges and carrying this. It's doing you more. You're carrying burdens, <laughs> and burdens, and burdens over the year, and sometimes they're just accumulating. You're accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. You you wonder why you wake up every day just feeling tired. Every day you're just feeling so sick. You're trying this relationship with my character development. <laughs> you're trying this. It's not because sometimes you've carried so much baggage that. You know, you could have let go of by just having that one conversation, you know, and just start somewhere, you know. Sometimes you have excuses. You with, you try and start a relationship uh, and then you say, oh, I grew up in a toxic home. And now everything is just, you wonder why you can't just be a good person to people who are good to you, you know. Why? Because you've not let go of this trauma that 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 was inflicted upon you yeah so um just just on that point i think the thing that also i think many people fear and sometimes legitimately and which might seem like the reason they are hanging on to onto their grudges is the lack of safety or 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 sense of safety that would come with maybe you trying to be the the bigger person and the other people actually thinking that now they you're justifying yourself in as as in they were right all along and never you are the problem you know it, it's like you you're reaching out but you validate their sense of uh, because there's also that weird dynamic uh, where sometimes you you thought that what what it would, what this would result in doesn't is, is a rapprochement, mm-hmm. and th- that risk is is I think one one of the biggest but fears people have, um, not 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 in in any way justifying the mm. why people shouldn't try, mm. but I think that um, that that if 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 you step out and you're also aware of the potential for it, not necessarily panning out the way you are and you sort of make peace with that you know but here's the thing mm. um, and what we say about that and many other things you'll never know if you never try mm. right and mm. you keep living in this space it's even worse you keep living in this space of anxiety of anxiety and certainty I wouldn't know which word 
But you keep living in that space for, will it be okay? Will it not be okay? Should I? Should I? So that keeps still, it still keeps it's, eating you up. You'd rather just try. If it doesn't work out, you'll know. You've made peace with yourself. I tried. I did my bit. I did my I, bit. I brought this thing to to a head so that things could be resolved. Mm-hmm. They weren't. And they weren't. It's okay. I can. I have my peace. I agree. Rather than sitting there and they're like, huh. And sometimes vulnerability is all it takes. I mean, in relationships, whichever relationship, whether it's family, parent to child, whatever, vulnerability has to be there. You can't build a legit relationship without vulnerability. And the fear of I have to look like the bigger person or I look like I look like a simp, I look like I didn't know I look it's just just be vulnerable. In that space and time you don't know what can happen, you don't know how they'll respond. And it's okay. Sit in that space of vandra- being vulnerable. A lot of us don't like being vulnerable. It's a very scary place because what can happen to me, what can happen to my reputation, what can happen to my image, you know, what can happen to... There's a lot of what can happen to, but you never know. Vulnerability in any relationship is fundamental. Thank you. I think on that note... Um, I think that's on that note we bring you look like you're really introspecting (laughs) yes I am (laughs) but you you have actually raised um, you've raised certain certain perspectives which would like make me naturally want to delve further in that but I'm just now cognizant of the time that uh, we need to bring this to a close Uh, we would probably want to the aspects of of that this conversation which have morphed into a space that um, I would want hopefully you would we would invite you again to have a further discussion around it Mm -hmm. Uh, because it you sound to me like you probably offering something which in terms of a solution which many people may not necessarily immediately grasp grasp uh, or some of it might, might outrightly reject especially yes, yes. now that we are in this space where everybody is asserting their rights and their interests and their, how much they know and nobody <laughs> can mess with me you know so so if 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 what you're offering as a as, as, as a solution to a lot of this goes counter to that, it's like, wait a minute. So yeah. that's, that's the thing mm. we need to discuss mm. a bit. Um, uh, and may, but maybe we can look for another opportunity to do that. So Dr. Ari, thank you very, very, very much. If we are to reach you, uh, like, um, uh, how do people reach you if they need to? Uh, physically? You can catch me at in the Jeremy busy Moody. facility. Very <laughs> 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 busy facility. I uh, guess. Uh, uh, we also do online sessions mm-hmm. for those who may not. Uh, I mean, who may want to have online sessions. We also do that. I can always catch me on my social media handles. Mm-hmm. Alternatively. Uh, email, email. I choose. I choose not to do phone. Yes, for a particular oh, for, reason. Yes, you don't want me calling you at midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and e- email is usually a bit better because yes. it's a very direct way of communicating. My name is so and so. I have this certain certain problem. Calls, messages. Sometimes people are just like, "Hi." They're like, "Hi." Mm-hmm. How are you? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> so an email is a bit more direct. Someone will not send you a, an email of hi. Yes. You know, they'll say hi. My name is so. I have this this. and then I wanted to book an appointment, and that becomes a bit easier. So, yeah. Okay. So my email. Email is 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 is, is the best. Which is D R D R Nyamute. Yes. At gmail dot com. Dr Nyamute at gmail dot com. Yes. Um. 
So in closing, future plans in this space professionally, do you have, um, do you want to do PhD, five of them? And then you, yeah, what are your future plans? Because I'm already in academia, so PhD is in the line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mental health advocacy is also quite uh, a space I'm very, very much interested in, Mm -hmm. uh, which I I am in, not interested in, which is a space I am in, always. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you find me, I am ready to talk about something mental health. Okay. (laughs) So, uh, probably explore that a bit more. We've been doing uh, shows here and there. Had a YouTube channel that collapsed. Briefly, we are reviving it. (laughs) CPR. (laughs) Yes. Um, To jump to say, we we revive. Yeah, yes. CPR, yes. We are Mm -hmm. doing... Chest compression. It will revive. It will, I, um, it will, faith. You have faith. Of faith. Yes, yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, the advocacy space. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm sure we will be. Oh, you didn't tell us about um, how far thi- how things are looking regarding the mental health awareness. So May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which is usually the busiest month for me. <laughs> And many other people who are associated with uh, doing advocacy. So from the Kenya Psychiatric Association. Oh, did I say? I mean, the Kenya Psychiatric Association. I'm a board member. So... You need to say that, like, really loud, like, so everybody, like, sits up. (laughs) Kenya Psychiatric Association. (laughs) 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 Yes. um, So every year we do an awareness campaign in the month of May. Uh, to just create awareness on various issues that touch on the community. We try to look at whatever issue is more rampant at that time. Uh, Last year, we did mental health in the arts, entertainment, and sports industry. This year, we're doing um, violence and mental health. We've had a lot of issues, violence, intrapersonal, that is suicides, interpersonal homicides and other violence directed to other people. So, yes, we are on the platforms talking about violence. Violence, we have weekly webinars that we do on Wednesday evenings uh, at 7 p.m. on different aspects of violence. As we said, violence is not only the physical violence that we know, but we also have various forms of violence. So, yes, on all the platforms you can find us, Kenya Psychiatric Association. And the walk. Yes, and we have a walk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. No, I, I think know, I'm, right? I'm so overwhelmed. Tired, I told you yes, it's me. So, <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, so we have a walk coming up on the 27th of May to be at Arboretum. Uh, yes, it will be very exciting. Also, if you want to catch your healthcare professionals, ask them a question or two, maybe you have a personal question that probably is burning you, that could be a very good space to, you know, Bridge that that fear, you know. Mm. Imagine we are so approachable. Mm. You'll, you, you'll be surprised. <laughs> yes. We also have a free mental health screening for all the participants who want to, I mean, who will attend. Of course, we will not force people to do it, but we encourage them to do so. Um, yes, a registration fee is 500 shillings for adults, 200 shillings for children. Yeah. And it starts at 8 a.m. These guys will all be there. They 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 agreed. Cindy, you hey. guys will be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one is scared to be screened. Uh, this one. <laughs> 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 so thank you very much, Dectari. Yes. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that uh, this is a good time to bring uh, this episode to a close. Uh, Once again, um, I would like to remind you to kindly uh, subscribe to our channel and follow us on uh, social media. Um, Keep us engaged. Let us do the work of normalizing conversations around mental health. And mental health is a positive thing. Mental health is not mental illness. And that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to keep as many of us mentally healthy and also provide support for those who are 
um, facing any mental health challenges, including mental health illness. Uh, the more people know about mental health, the more we normalize these conversations, the better society will become, and hopefully the more fulfilled we will all feel. Um, thank you very, very much for uh, listening to us. Uh, and Dr. Tari, once again, thank you very, very much for showing up uh, on uh, to, to share with us your views and insights. Um, until we meet again, my name is Charles Adede, and this is Me, I Am Mental, the podcast where we discuss all things mental. Bye-bye. <laughs>